You can come up with systems that allow you to identify yourself without necessarily losing your uh, anonymity. Yeah? In other words, you can go to a chat room or to a website and you don't have to show who you are and you can still legitimize yourself. Complicated, don't ask me exactly how it's done, but you can do it. Yeah? That's what EIDM systems are about. When in the EU they're now talking about exchanging data, they're saying everybody should have an ID card or an EIDM system. But the Commission has accepted that the choice is left to the member states as to what they want to use. Some states, they say, want to use the ID card for general identification purposes, like I just mentioned. Other countries want to have the more restrictive EIDM system under which what data are revealed when you go online is controlled and limited. But this, in a way, is throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You cannot have it both ways. If Europe wants to interconnect people and allow them to be European citizens everywhere, then everywhere should have the highest standards of the IDM system. You cannot allow the British and a few others to get away with an ID card that basically creates a massive database because it will also become trans-European. You can't have a boat with a hole in it and say it's only a hole in the front, not on the right, sorry, starboard. Yeah? Um, once you build in a hole, it is going to seep through the whole, the whole system. So e-identity management is a big problem. Joint up government and full societal alliance, that's basically what I was talking about in the children's database. The idea, this is another British term, joint up government. The different branches of government should join up. It is again presented as something positive. Yeah? If somebody moves house, you have to tell 17 different authorities of your new address. <coughs> Wouldn't it be much easier if you just told one authority of your new address and then everybody would know it? Yes, we all agree. Yeah? That's not the same as saying, next time you, may, you need uh, an injection for some kind of disease, let's pass this on to every authority you've ever been in touch with. But that is what it very often starts to amount to. Um, the moment you say all the different arms of government should join up, you very quickly also say they should all exchange data freely, which is exactly what's happening in, in, in the United Kingdom. In other countries, particularly Germany, to a certain extent France, there are much better data protection principles in place that stop this happening. But the trend is very, very strongly against the data protection principles and four bigger databases and four more interconnecting of databases. And it's very, very difficult to go against that tide. It's extremely difficult to maintain the data protection principles when the technology makes it so easy to move in the other direction. And that is what, that's exactly what's happening. And then we have the big catalyst, terrorism. Yeah? Because every time you come up with some restrictions, let's not do this, let's not do that, let's not plant bugs on people's computers, let's not do um, exchange data about children or whatever. The big bear bug is always, ah, well, we won't do it for everybody, we'll only do it for the real baddies. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And things always start out with the real baddies. They always start out with terrorism, pedophilia, um, and organized crime. Some big problems there. Organized, organized crime, well, terrorism is very well defined. There are some attempts to define it, and I can go into the definitions in the various Council of Europe and EU uh, instruments. But by and large, it remains very vague, especially since there are a lot of what in English are called inchoate crimes, crimes around it, like um, expressing uh, opinions in favor of terrorism or giving moral or other support to terrorism. These are all crimes that I dealt with when I worked for Amnesty in the 1980s. Um, they're the crimes around terrorism that become so dangerous. Whenever a measure is taken against terrorism, that almost invariably includes all these outlying crimes. In Germany, I attended on behalf of Amnesty a number of trials of people who had painted slogans on motorway bridge. Yeah? to somebody who made a family house that I have, for the putting together of prisoners in the Red Army faction. Okay, criminal damage because they put paint on the motorway bridge, nobody doubted that. But they were charged with support for a terrorist organization because they supported the aims of the Red Army faction, which was that they were put together in 
large groups, and they didn't do it out of humanitarian motives, but the prosecutor thought, and therefore they had to be charged with, with that particular crime. The problem with terrorism is that at Skatsk Stone, organized crime, same thing. Serious crime, same thing. What is serious crime? What is organized crime? More than two? What is international crime? Very easy to stretch it. The next thing is, once you have these things on the statute book for those crimes, they will be extended to other crimes. This goes back as far as the Inquisition. I had a marvelous book which I lent to a student and have therefore lost. <laughs> <laughs> it's called The History of Torture. Very good book by a chap called Rutgen. Now, Malia Malvice Rutgen. And he describes in it how tortures crept into the criminal justice system in the late Middle Ages. We all seem to think that criminal justice in the Middle Ages was all terrible, everybody was tortured until they confessed. In fact, that's not true. Uh, I've been to Croatia a lot of times, and we've been looking, incidentally, while I was there, there were some seminars on 11th, 12th century laws. They were very restricted in their use of torture. Very restricted. You couldn't use torture, you could only use a very limited amount of torture, dependent on the seriousness of the crime, dependent on the amount of witnesses. There were a lot of restrictions. Yeah? Still barbaric, but it was much more restricted than we thought it was. Then the Inquisition came and said, well, ha, we've got heretics, they are so bad, we can't have all these silly little restrictions. Let's break the rules open a little bit. And that's exactly what they did. The Jesuits, Killy, breaking open, they were also the great fighters against uh, torture later on, but in the beginning, they were the ones that broke open the rules. Ah, this is not new torture, it's a continuation of the one that was authorized yesterday. So uh, we can keep on doing it. And as Longbein said, I, have, I forgot the exact quote, but there is a, a historical law that whenever measures are introduced into the criminal justice system to deal with out cases, cases that are beyond the pale, once they're accepted for these terrible cases, they will creep into the general system. And I have always held that rule up and noticed it whenever I've worked uh, in the human rights field. You cannot introduce measures against terrorism that will not seep into the general criminal law. And this is typically what happens. So the drivers are, there is more data, it's encouraged from Europe. The joint up government and ID card system is, is uh, encouraged and the fight against terrorism is encouraged. Right, now let's go to the problems, right? This is one of the first problems. What is done with these data? It's not just a matter of saying, let's look at all 25 to 35 year old uh, people of Pakistani background who have traveled to Pakistan in the last two or three years and who have attended a particular mosque. It's a kind of rough profile that you might sort of say is halfway sensible, it isn't really, but you might think it's halfway sensible in trying to feed, to filter out a limited number of possible suspects from a large population. That is not how it's done. And interestingly enough, again, I can draw a bit of experience in a totally different field, and that is in direct marketing. Direct marketing has always, long gone, so the last 20 years, extensive data mining and scoring. And I don't know if you know these words, but um, uh, it means getting a lot of aggregate data and a lot of data on a particular person, analyzing it, coming up with an algorithm, a number, right? And applying that number to an individual. So I might feed in where somebody lives, how rich that area is, or how poor that area is, what age the person has, whether he's married or not married, what kind of qualifications. Um, what kind of uh, food and drink I know he has been eating for the last week. We put a lot of us when he goes on holidays, all kind of stuff. Yeah? I put that against the general database, and now somebody comes to you and says, I want to sell lawn mowers. Okay? You can come up with an algorithm of somebody who's more likely than other people to buy a lawn mower. So if you do a mail shot, and you send people a mailing, yeah? What the Chapel owns the, 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 the 